78 Degrees of Wisdom, a book of Tarot revised by Rachel Pallack. A Psychological Approach to the Tarot, Examining All Aspects of the Tarot. Part 1. The Major Arcana. Introduction. Origins of the Tarot. Around the middle of the 15th century, not so long after the first written references in Europe to cards of any kind, an artist named Bonificio Bimbo painted a set of unnamed and unnumbered cards from the Visconti family of Milan. These pictures comprise the classic deck for an Italian game called Tarocci, four suits of four ten cards each. Four suits of fourteen cards each plus 22 cards showing different scenes, and later called Tronfi, in English, Triumphs, or Trumps. Now of these 22 images, many can be interpreted as simply a catalog of medieval social types, such as to give them their later names, the Pope, or the Emperor, or else common medieval moral homilies, such as the Wheel of Fortune. Some represent virtues, like temperance or fortitude. Others show religious mythological scenes, such as the dead rising from the grave at the trumpet call for the last judgment. There is even a card depicting a popular heresy, the image of a female pope, which can be described as a joke in the church with rather deeper significance than most ecclesiastical humor. Still, we can view this heretic picture as deeply rooted in popular culture, and therefore obvious to someone representing medieval types. One figure, however, stands out as rather strange. It shows a young man hanging upside down by his left foot from a simple wooden frame. His hands are held casually behind his back to form a triangle with his head at the bottom. His right leg is bent behind his knee to produce the figure of a cross, or also, or else the numeral four. The face appears relaxed, even perhaps entranced. Where did Bimbo derive this image? It certainly does not represent a criminal hanged, at the gallows, as some later artists have assumed, and Italy traders were sometimes hanged upside down, and in fact many modern Italian decks call this card La Apezeo, the traitor. But there is no evil implicit in Bimbo's figure. The young man appears beautiful and at peace. Christian tradition describes St. Peter as being crucified upside down, ostensibly so he could not be said to be copying his lord. The elder Edda described the god Odin hanging from the world tree for nine days and nights, not as a punishment, but in order to receive enlightenment, the gift of prophecy. But this mythological, mythological scene itself derives from the actual practice of shamans, medicine men and women in such places as Siberia and North America. In initiation and training, the candidates for shamanism are sometimes told to hang upside down. Apparently, the reversal of the body produces some sort of psychological benefit in a way that in a way that starvation and extreme cold will induce radiant visions the alchemists who with the witches were possibly the survivors of the shamanist shamanist tradition in europe also hung themselves upside down believing that elements in the sperm vital to immortality would thus flow down to the psychic centers at the top of the head and even before the Western, be the West began to take yoga seriously, everyone knew the image of the yogi standing on his head. Did Bimbo simply wish to present an alchemist? Then why not use the more common image that of a bearded man steering a cauldron or mixing chemicals? The picture titled The Hanged Man in subsequent decks and later made famous by T.S. Eliot in The Wasteland, appears not so much as an alchemist as a young initiate in some secret tradition. Was Bimbo himself an initiate? The special, cross, the special crossings of the legs would suggest so. If he included the one reference to esoteric, esoteric practices, might not, might not other images superficially a social commentary in reality represent an entire body of occult knowledge? Why, for instance, did the original deck contain 22 cards, not say 20 or 21 or 25, all of which are more commonly given significance in Western culture? 
Was it chance or did Bimbo or perhaps other whom Bimbo simply copied wish to slyly represent the esoteric meanings connected to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet? And yet, if any evidence exists anywhere connecting Bimbo or the Visconti family to any occult group, no one has produced it yet for public scrutiny. A brief look at the stunning correspondences between the tarot and the body of the Jewish mysticism and occult knowledge, called collectively the Kabbalah, will demonstrate the way in which Bimbo's card seems almost to demand an esoteric interpretation despite the lack of hard evidence. The Kabbalah dwells very deeply on the symbolism of the Hebrew alphabet. The letters are connected to the paths of the Tree of Life and they are each given their own symbolic meaning. Now the Hebrew alphabet contains as noted 22 letters, the same number as the trumps of Tarochi. The Kabbalah also gives deeply into the four letters of the God's unpronounced name, YHVH. They represent the four worlds of creation, the four basic elements of medieval science, four stages of existence, four methods of interpreting the Bible, and so on. There are four court cards in each of Bimbo's four suits. Finally, the Kabbalah works with the number 10. The Ten Commandments and Ten Sephiroth stages of, eman of emanation on each of the four trees of life. And the four suits contain cards numbered from 1 to 10. Do we wonder then that tarot commentators have claimed that the deck originated as a practical version of the Kabbalah, meaning meaningless to the masses, but highly potent to the few? And yet, in all the thousands of pages of Kabbalistic literature, not one word appears about the tarot. Occultists have claimed secret sources for the cards, such as a grand conference of Kabbalists and other maesters in Morcaro in 1300, but no one has ever produced any historical evidence for such claims. Even more damning, the tarot commentators themselves do not mention the Kabbalah until the 19th century. And of course, the names and numbers sequence so vital to their interpretations came after the original images. If we accept Carl Jung's idea of basic spiritual archetypes structured into human mind, we can perhaps say that Bimbo unconsciously tapped into hidden springs of knowledge, allowing later imaginations to make the conscious connections. And yet such extinct and complete correspondences as the 22 trumps, the four court cards, and 10 pip cards in the four suits or the position and ecstatic face of the hanged man would seem to strain even such a potent force as the collective unconsciousness. For years, Tarochi has seen primarily as a game for gambling, and to a much lesser extent as a device for fortune telling. Then in the 18th century, an occultist named Antoine Court de Gabelline declared the tarot, as the French called the game, to be the remnant of the Book of Thoth, created by the Egyptian god of magic to convey all knowledge to his disciples. Corte de Gabelline's idea appears far more fanciful than, than factual, but in the 19th century, another Frenchman, Alphonse Louis Constant, known as the Eliphas Levy, linked the cards to the Kabbalah, and since then, people have looked deeper and deeper into the tarot, finding more and more meanings, wisdom, and even through meditation and deep study, enlightenment. Today, we see the tarot as a kind of path, a way to personal growth through understanding of ourselves and life. To some, the tarot's origins remains a vital question. For others, it only matters that meanings have occurred to the cards over the years. For Bimbo, and whoever his predecessors might have been, did create an archetype, whether consciously or from deep instinct, beyond any system or detailed explanation, the images themselves changed and elaborated over the years by different artists, fascinate and entra entra entrance us. In this way, they draw us into their mystery world, which ultimately can never be explained, but only experienced. Different versions of the tarot. Most modern tarots differ from little from those 15th century sets of cards, they still contain 78 cards divided into the four suits, the wand, cup, swords, and coins, or pentacles, called collectively the minor arcana, and the 22 trumps known as the major arcana. The word arcanum means secret knowledge. True, some of the pictures have changed considerably, but each version usually keeps the same basic concept. For example, there are several widely varying versions of the emperor but they all represent some idea of an emperor. In general, the changes have tended towards the more symbolic and more mystical. This book uses as its primary source the tarot of Arthur Edward White, 
whose very popular writer pack, named after its British publisher, appeared in 1910. White was criticized for changing some of the trump cards from their accepted versions. For instance, the common picture of the sun shows two children holding hands in a garden. White changed it to one child on a horse riding out of a garden. The critics claimed White was altering the card's meaning to its personal vision. This was probably the case since White believed more strongly in his own ideas than those of anyone else. But few people stopped to consider that the earliest versions of the sun, that of Bimbo, in no way resemble the supposed traditional version the traditional version. It indeed it seems closer to White's. The picture shows a single miraculous child flying through the air holding up a human head radiating light. The most striking change White has and his art his artist Polymia Coleman Smith made was to include a scene on all of the cards, including the number cards of the minor arcana. Virtually all previous decks, as well as many later ones, have simple geometric patterns for the pip cards. For example, the Ten of Swords will show ten swords arranged in a pattern. Much like its descendant, the Ten of Spades. The Raider pack is different. Pamela Smith's Ten of Swords shows a man lying under a black cloud with ten swords stuck in his back and legs. We do not know really... We do not really know who actually designed these cards. Did White himself convince them? Has he undoubtedly did the major arcana? Or did he simply tell Smith the qualities and ideas he wanted and allowed her to invest the scenes? White's own book on the tarot, The Pictorial Key to the Tarot, makes little real use of the pictures. In some cases, such as the Six of Swords, the picture suggests far more than White started me stated meaning. While in others, particularly the Two of Swords, the picture almost contradicts the meaning. Whether it was White or Smith who designed the pictures, they had a powerful effect on later tarot designers. Almost all decks with scenes on every card relay very heavily on the pictures in the Rider pack. White called his deck the Rectified Tarot. He insisted that his pictures restored the true meaning of the cards, and throughout his book he scorns the version of his predecessors. Now by rectifying many people will think White's membership in secret societies gave him a cross to the original secret tarot. More likely, he simply meant that his pictures gave the cards their deepest meanings. When he so drastically altered the card of the lovers, for instance, he did so because he thought the old picture insignificant and his new one symbolic of a deep truth. I do not mean to suggest that White's cards are simply an intellectual construction, like a scholar rearranging some speech of Hamlet's in a way which makes him more sense to him. White was a mystic, an occultist, and a student of magic and esoteric practices. He based his tarot on deep personal experience of enlightenment. He believed his tarot to be right and others wrong because it represented that experience. I have chosen the wider pack as my source for two reasons. First, I find many of its innovate innovations extremely valuable. The White Smith version of The Fool strikes me as more meaningful than any of the earlier ones. Secondly, the revolutionary change in the minor arcana seems to me to free us from the formulas that dominated the suit cards for so long. Previously, once you have read and memorized the given meanings of a minor card, you could not really add to it. The picture suggested very little. In the writer pack, we can allow the picture to work on the subconscious. We can also apply our own experience to it. In short, P Pamela Smith has given us something to interp interpret. Above, I wrote that I chose the writer pack as my primary source. Most books on the tarot use one deck alone for illustrations. This self-limitation -limit perhaps stems from a desire to represent the true tarot. By choosing one deck and not others, we are all relying to declaring that one is correct and others is false. Such a declaration matters most to those writers like Aleister Crowley or Paul Faust Case, who consider the tarot a symbolic system of objective knowledge. This book, however, looks upon the cards more as an archetype of experience. Seen that way, no deck is right or wrong, but is simply a furthering of the archetype. The tarot is both the total of all the different versions over the years and an entity apart from any of them. In the case where versions other than White's will deepen the meaning of a specific card, we will look at both images. 
in some cases judgment for instance or the moon the differences are subtle in other words the lovers or the fool the difference is drastic by looking at several versions of the same experience we heighten our awareness of that experience divination today most people see the terrorism meanings of fortune telling or divination strangely we know less historically about this aspect of the cards than any other Judging by the comparatively few historical references to divination as opposed to gambling, the practice did not become common until some time after the introduction of the cards themselves. Possibly the Romani or Gypsies came across the game of Tarochi on their travels in Europe and decided to use the cards for fortune telling. Our individuals developed the concept the earliest written references on individual interpretations, though they might have derived from some earlier system not written down but in general use and the Romani took it from them. People used to believe that the Romani themselves brought the cards from Egypt. The fact is, the Romani probably came from India, and they arrived in Spain a good hundred years after the tarot cards were introduced in Italy and France. In the section on readings, we will consider just what divination does, and how such an outrageous practice could possibly work. Here we can simply observe that people can and have told fortunes with anything. The smoky innards of slaughtered beasts, bird patterns across the sky, colored stones, tossed coins, anything. The practice stems from the simple desire to know in advance what is going to happen, and more subtly, from the inner conviction that everything is connected. Everything has meaning and that nothing occurs at random. The very idea of randomness is really very modern. It developed out of the dogma that cause and effect is the only valid connection between two events. Events without this logical joining are random that is meaningless previously however people thought in terms of correspondences events or patterns in one area of existence correspond to patterns in other areas the pattern of the zodiac corresponds to the pattern of the person's life the pattern of a tea leaf in the bottom of a cup corresponds to the outcome of a battle everything is connected the idea has always claimed its adherence, and recently even some scientists impressed by the way events will occur in series, like a run of bad luck, have begun to look seriously at it. If we can use anything for fortune telling, why use the tarot? The answer is that any system will tell us something. The value of that something depends on the inherent wisdom of the system. Because the tarot pictures carry deep significance all by themselves, the patterns they form in reading can teach us a great deal about ourselves and life in general. Unfortunately, most diviners over the years have ignored these deeper meanings, preferring simply for formulas, a dark man who disposed to help the quarant. Easily interpret and quickly dis digested by the client. The formula meanings are often contradictory as well as blunt, with no indications of how to choose between them. This situation holds true especially for the minor arcana which is the bulk of the deck. Almost no works on the tarot have treated this subject fully. Most serious studies, those which deal with the deep meanings of the major arcana, either do not mention the minor cards at all or simply throw in another set of formulas at the back as a grudging ad addition for those readers who will insist on using the deck for fortune telling. Even White has mentioned simply gives us gives his own formula to the remarkable pictures drawn by Pumalimia Smith. While this book will deal extensively with the concepts of embodied in the cards and their symbolism, it will also look carefully at the application of these concepts to tarot readings. Many writers, nobly white, have denigrated divination as a degenerate use of the cards. But the proper use of reading can greatly increase your awareness of the cards' meanings. It is one thing to study the symbolism of a, picture, of a particular card. It is something else to see that card in combination with other cards. Many times I have seen specific readings upon open up important meanings that would not have emerged in any other way. Readings teach us a general lesson as well, a very important one, in a manner no explanation can possibly equal. They demonstrate that no card, no approach to life is good or bad except in the context of the moment. Finally, giving readings gives each person a chance to renew his or her intuitive feelings for the pictures themselves. All the symbolism, all the archetypes, all the explanations given in this book are, or any other 
can only prepare you to look at pictures and say, this card tells me. Chapter 1. The Four Card Pattern. Unity and Duality. Through its long history, the Major Arcana has attracted a great many interpretations. Today, we tend to look upon the trumps as a psychological process, one that shows us passing through different stages of existence to reach a state of full development. We can describe this state for the moment as unity with the world around us, or perhaps liberation for weakness, confusion, and fear. The full arcana describes this process in detail, but to get an understanding of it as a whole, we need to look at only four cards, four basic ar archetypes arranged in a graphic pattern of evolution and spiritual awareness. If you have your own deck of writer pack tarot cards, remove the fool, the magician, the high priestess, and the world, and place them in the diamond pattern shown over leaf. Look at them for a while. Notice that while both the fool and the world show dancing joyful figures, the magician and the high priestess are stationary and unmoving in their positions. If you glance through the rest of the major arcana, you will notice that all the trumps, about 0 and 21, are drawn as if staged for a still photograph. Rather than, say, a motion picture, they represent themselves as fixed states of existence. But there is a difference between the two dancers, the fool rushes forward richly clothed, the figure in the world is naked. The fool looks about to leap into the lower world from some high distant country. The world paradoxically appears outside the material universe, the dancer is suspended in a magical wealth of victory. Note also the numbers of the four cards. Zero is not strictly a number at all, rather it is, represents the absence of any specific number. And therefore, we can say that it contains all numbers within itself. It symbolizes infinite potentiality. All things remain possible because no definite form has been taken. One and two are the first genuine numbers, the first reality, again, a fixed state. They form their archetypes odd and even and therefore represent all opposites, male and female, light and dark, passive and active, etc. But 21 combines these two numbers in one figure. Look at their postures. The magician rises, a magic wand, to heaven. Besides the ideas of spirit and unity, the phallic wand symbolizes maleness. The high priestess sits between two pillars, a vaginal symbol as well as a symbol of duality. These two pillars appear again and again in the major arcana, in such obvious places as the temple and the hierophant, and in more subtle ways, like the two lovers on the card six, or the two sphinxes harnessed to the chariot. But now look at the world. The dancer, a female figure, though some decks represent her as a hermaphrodite, carry two magic wands, one in each hand. The male and female are unified and more. Their separate qualities are subordinated to the higher freedom and journey shown in a light way the dancer holds these powerful symbols. Clearly then, while the horizontal line, the magician and the high priestess shows a duality of opposites, the vertical line 0 and 21 shows a unity, the fool being some sort of perfect state before duality and the world giving us a glimpse of the exhilarating sense of freedom possible, if only we can reconcile the opposites buried in our psyches. The tarot, like many systems of thought, indeed like many mythologi mytho mytholo mythologies, symbols duality as separation of male and female. The Kabbalists believe that Adam was originally hermaphroditic, and that Eve only became a separate from him so that they might regard each other as independent beings. In most cultures, to a greater or lesser degree, men and women see each other as a very distinct, almost separate societies. Today, many people think of each person as having both masculine and feminine qualities, but previously such an idea was found only in esoteric doctrines of unification. If we picture duality dramatically as male and female or black and white, we also experience more subtle spits, splits in our ordinary lives, especially between our hopes, what we imagine is possible, and the reality of what we achieve. Very often the actions we take turn out not to fulfill our hopes for them. The marriage gives less than the total happiness expected. The job or career brings more frustration than fulfillment. Media artists have said that the paintings on the canvas are never the paintings they envisioned. They never can express what they really wanted to say. Somehow the reality of life is always less than the potential. Act acutely aware of this, many people agonize over every decision, no matter how small or great, 
because they cannot accept that once they take on action in one direction, they have lost a chance to go in all other directions previously open to them. They cannot accept the limitations of acting in the real world. The split between potentiality and reality is sometimes seen as the separation between mind and body. We sense that our thoughts and emotions are something distinct from our physical presence in the world. The mind is unlimited, able to go anywhere in the universe backwards or forwards in time. The body is weak, subject to hunger, tiredness, sickness. Attempting to resolve this separation, people have gone to philosophical extremes. Behaviorists have claimed that mind does not exist, only the body and the habits it develops are real. At the other end, many mystics have experienced the body as an illusion created by our limited understanding. Christian tradition defines the soul as the immortal true self existing before and after the body that contains it. Now, many religions and sects such as the Gnostics and some Kabbalists have considered the body a prison created by the sins or mistakes of our fallen ancestors. At the source of all these dualities we feel we do not know ourselves. We sense that deep down our true nature is something stronger, freer, with great wisdom and power, or else a thing of violent passions and furious animals desire. Either way, we know that this true self hides or perhaps lies buried deep inside our normal society-restricted personalities. But how do we reach it? Assuming the essential self to be a thing of beauty and power, how do we liberate it? The disciplines we call the occult sciences begin with a strong awareness of all these splits and limitations. They then go on, however, to another idea, that there exists a key or a plan to bring everything together to unify, to unify our lives with our hopes. As we release our latent strength and wisdom, people often confuse the purposes of spiritual disciplines. Many think that the tarot is for fortune telling, that alchemists want to become rich by changing lead to gold, that Kabbalists work spells by saying secret words, and so on. In reality, these disciplines aim at a psychological unification. The base metal that the alchemist wished to change to gold is himself. Accepting the doctrine, accepting the doctrine that we have fallen from a perfect state to a limited one. The occultists do not believe we must simply wait passively for some future redemption but an outside agent. On the contrary, he or she believes it is our responsibility to bring about that redemption by finding the key to unity. The tarot depicts a version of that key. It is not the key, just as it is not really a secret doctrine. It represents a process, and one of the things that it teaches us is that we make a mistake when we assume that unification comes through any simple key or formula. Rather, it comes through growth and increased awareness as we travel step by step through the 21 stages of the major arcana. The fool represents true ignorance, a kind of perfect state of joy and freedom, a feeling of being one with the spirit of life at all times. In other words, the immortal self we feel become entrapped in the confusions and compromises of the ordinary world. Perhaps such a radiant self never really existed. Somehow we experience our intuition of it as something lost. Virtually every culture has developed a myth of a fall from a primeval paradise. Innocence is a word often misunderstood. It does not mean without guilt, but rather a freedom and total openness to a life, a complete lack of fear that comes through a total faith in living in your own inst instinctive self. Innocence does not mean asexual, as some people think. It is sexuality expressed without fear, without guilt, without con connivance and dishonesty. It is sexuality expressed spontaneously and freely as the expression of love and the ecstasy of life. The fool bears a number zero because all things are possible to the person who is always reading, ready, to go in any direction. He does not belong in any specific place. He is not fixed like the other cards. His innocence makes him a person with no past and therefore an infinite future. Every moment is a new starting point. In Arabic numbers, the number zero bears the shape of an egg to indicate that all things emerge from it. Originally, the zero was written as a dot. In Hermetic and Kabbalistic tradition, the universe emerged from a single point of light and God in the Kabbalah is often described as nothingness because, of, because to describe God as anything would be to limit him to some finite fixed state. Those tarot commentators who argue whether the fool belongs before, after, or somewhere bef 
between the other cards seem to be missing the point. The fool is moment change, the constant leap through life. For the fool, no difference exists between possibility and reality. Zero means a total emptiness of hopes and fears, and the fool accepts nothing, plans nothing. He responds instantly to the immediate situation. Other people will receive his complete spontane spontaneity. Nothing calculated, nothing held back. He does not do this deliberately, like someone consciously deciding to be wholly honest with a friend or a lover. The fool gives his honesty and love naturally to everyone without ever thinking about it. The fool we speak of as he and the world dancer as she because of their appearance in the pictures. But both can be a woman or a man with really no change. Just as the fool does not experience a separateness from the physical world, so he or she does not experience any isolation from the opposite sex. The fool and the dancer are psychic hermaphrodites, expressing their complete humanity at all times by their very natures. Now look again at the four card pattern. See how the fool splits into the magician and the high priestess, who must be brought back together again to form the world. The two cards represent the splitting up of the fool's innocence into the illusion of opposites. The world shows us a restored unity, but a higher and deeper unity achieved through the growth outlined in other 18 cards. The fool is innocence, but the world is wisdom. Innocence and Freedom The fool teaches us that life is simply a continuous dance of experience, but most of us cannot maintain even brief moments of such spontaneous and freedom due to fears, conditioning, and simply the very real problems of daily life. We necessarily allow our egos to isolate us from experience, yet within us we can sense dimly the possibility of freedom, and therefore we call this vague feeling of a loss a fall from innocence. Once we lose that innocence, however, we cannot simply climb back to the level of the fool. Instead, we must struggle and learn through maturity, self-discovery, and spiritual awareness until we reach the greater freedom of the world. The magician represents action, the high priestess passivity, the magician maleness, the high priestess femaleness, the magician consciousness, the high priestess unconsciousness. By consciousness, we do not mean the high awareness of the world, but rather the powerful yet limited consciousness of ego as it creates an outer universe of boundaries and forms. This description does not mean to degenerate or belittle the magician creative force. What greater creativity is there than giving shape to the chaos of experience? It is the magician who gives life its meanings and purpose. Healers, artists, and occultists have all focused on the magician as their patron card. Nevertheless, his power represents an isolation from the freedom of the fool or the understanding of the world. In the same way, the high priestess indicates in her unconscious a very deep state of intuitive awareness, and yet her inner knowledge does not belong to that radiant center of nothingness that, that enables the fool to act so freely. The high priestess represents the archetype of inner truth, but because this inner truth is unconscious, inexpressible she can maintain it only through total passivity the situation shows itself in life in numerous ways we all carry within us a dim sense of who we are or a genuine self never seen by other people and impossible to explain but the women and men who throw themselves into competitive careers responsibilities without working at the same time to increase self-knowledge often discover at some point that they have lost a sense of who they are and what they have once wanted in life now, directly opposite to these people, the Buddhist monk or nun withdraws from the world because the slightest involvement would distract them from the center of their meditation. Both the magician and the high priestess bear an archetypal purity. In a way, they have not lost the fool's radiance. They have simply split it up into light and darkness. In the traditional split of the Western and Eastern religion, the magician represents the West with its emphasis on action and historical salvation, the high priestess, the East, the way of separation from the world and time. Yet those who have gone deeper in both traditions will combine these elements. The high priestess sits between the pillars of light and dark. Though she herself symbolizes the dark passive side, her intuition can find a balance between the two. This is less paradoxical than it sounds. 
If we sense our lives as filled with opposites which we cannot resolve, we can react in either of the two ways. We can rush back and forth, going from one extreme to the other, or we can do absolutely nothing. Sit in the middle, not seduced in either direction, but passive, allowing the opposites to go on around you. Except, of course, that this too is a choice. And eventually we lose that balance and that inner knowledge simply because life continues as around us. In Coppolis imagery, the high priestess represents the pillar of harmony, a force which reconciles the opposing pillars of mercy and judgment. Therefore, she sits between the two pillars of the temple, but without the ability to blend in the active force of the magician, the high priestess's sense of harmony becomes swept away. As archetypes, the magician and the high priestess cannot exist in our lives any more than the fool can. Inevitably, we mix up these elements rather than blend them and thereby experience their lesser forms as confused action or else insecure and guilt-ridden passivity. In other words, the purity of two poles becomes lost because life muddles them together. The purpose of the major arcana is twofold. First of all, by the isolation of the elements of lives into archetypes and enabled us to see them in their pure forms as aspects of psychological truth. Secondly, it, help us, it helps us to truly resolve these different elements, to take us to step by step through the different stages of life until it brings us to unity. In reality, perhaps the innocence symbolizes by the fool never existed. Somehow we experience as something lost. The major arcana tells us how to get back, how to get it back. The Overview The Cards as a Sequence Most interpreters of the Major Arcana take one of two approaches. Either they consider the cards as separate entities or they look at them as a sequence. The first approach looks at each card as representing different qualities or situations of importance to a person's spiritual development. The Empress represents the soul, glorified in nature, the Emperor, mastery of self, etc. This system considers the numbers on the cards as part of their symbolic language. The number one belongs to the magician not because he comes first, but because that number signifies ideas, unity, willpower, appropriate to the concept of a magician. The second approach looks upon the trumps as a progression. The magician is one because, he quali because his qualities form the starting point of the growth pattern figured in the other cards. Card 13, say, belongs at just that point between the hangman and temperance and no other. Each new trump belongs upon the previous one and leads the way to the next. In general, I have followed the second method. While the number symbology should not be neglected, it is equally important to see where each card fits in the overall pattern. Comparisons with other numbers can also help us to see the limitations as well as the virtues of each card. For instance, the number 7. The chariot is often spoken of as victory, but what kind of victory? Is it the total liberation of the world or something narrower, but still of great value? Looking at the card's position can answer these questions. The interpreters who have taken this approach have usually looked for some, some place to divide the trumps for easier comprehension. The most common choice is the wheel of fortune. As the number 10, it symbolizes the completion of one cycle and beginning of another. Also, if you place the Fool at the beginning, this divides the cards neatly into two groups of eleven. Most importantly, the idea of turning wheel symbolizes a change of outlook, from a concern with external things such as success and romance, to the more inward approach depicted in such cards as Death and the Star. Despite the value of seeing the Major Arcana as two halves, I have found that the Trumps divided even more organically into three parts, setting the full apart as really a separate category all by itself, and setting, it up, and setting it apart allows us to see that it belongs everywhere and anywhere. Gives us 22 one cards, three groups of seven. The number seven has a long history in symbology. The seven planets of classic astrology, seven as a combination of three and four themselves archetypal numbers, seven pillars of wisdom, the seven lower stations of the tree of life, seven openings in the human head, seven chakras, and of course, seven days in the week. Most of the meanings of seven derive from the fact that before the telescope, people could see seven planets in the sky, and that is seven moving objects, the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and the sun, and Saturn. 
though the idea of seven day week comes from the ancient Israel, which may have got it from Babylonian, the European names for the days come from the planets as personified in the Roman and Norse gods. One particular aspect of seven relates it directly to the tarot. The Greek letter pi stands for a ratio that exists in all circles between the circumference and the diameter. No matter how large or small the circle, two will always work out to the same fraction, 22 over 7, and the major arcana with the fool comes to 22 just as without the fool it reduces to 7. Also, 22 times 7 equals 154. 154 adds up to 10, linking it to the wheel. And 154 divided by 2 for the 2 arcana comes to 77, the entire tarot with the fool again set aside. Like the Kabbalist conception of God, the point is nothing, yet the entire circle radiation from it. And the fool's number 0 has been represented as a point as well as a circle. The best reason for the division into three groups lie within the major arcana itself. First, consider the picture symbolism. Look at the first card in each line. The, ma the Magician and Strength are both obvious cards of power, but so is the Devil. The Magician and Strength are linked by the Infinity Sign above their heads, while the Devil bears a reversal pentacle. If you look at the Devil's posture, one arm up, one arm down, you will see the picture is in some ways a parody of the Magician. With the torch pointing down instead of the wand pointing up, in some decks, card 15 carries the title of Black Magician. In many decks, justice, not strength, is the number of eight. If you look at the posture of the figure in justice, you will see an even closer resemblance to the magician and the devil. To the same kind of vertical correspondences apply all the way through the three lines. The three areas of experience. The division into three allows us to see the major arcana as dealing with three distinct areas of experience. Briefly, we can call these consciousness, the outer concerns of life and society, subconsciousness, or the reach inward to find out who we really are, and superconsciousness, the development of spiritual awareness and a release of archetypal energy. The three levels are not forced categories, they derive from the cards themselves. The first line, with its concentration of on such matters as love, social authority, and education, describes the main concerns of society. In many ways, the world we see mirrored in our no novels, films, and schools is summed up by the first seven cards of the Major Arcana. A person can live and die, be judged a success by everyone around him or her without ever going beyond the level of the chariot. Many people, in fact, do not reach that level at all. Modern depth psychology concerns itself with the second line of Trump's, but there are symbols of a hermit-like withdrawal into self-awareness, followed by a symbolic death and rebirth. The angel of temperance at the end represents that part of ourselves which we discover to be essentially real after the illusion of ego, defensiveness, and rigid habits of the past are allowed to die away. Finally, what of the last line? What can go beyond finding our true selves? To put it simply, these seven cards depict a confrontation and finally a unity with the great forces of life itself. The other cards formerly seen as so important became merely the preparation for the great descent into darkness, the liberation of light, and the return of that light to the sunlit world of consciousness. To most readers, the last line will seem too vague and fanciful. We can call this subject matter religious or mythical, but these words you do remain hard to grasp. The vagueness in our minds perhaps speaks more about ourselves and our time than the object than about the object. Any society automatically teaches its people just by the language it uses to make certain assumptions about the world. Examples in our culture would include the vague and uniqueness of individuals, the reality and overwhelming importance of love, the necessity and freedom and social justice, and more complex, but just as strong, the basic separateness of each person. We are born alone and we die alone. Our society, built upon the materialist 18th and 19th centuries, does not merely reject the notion of superconsciousness or universal forces. We do not really know what they mean. 
When we deal with the last line of the major arcana, then we deal with an area uncomfortable for many of us. It will make the task of understanding these cards harder and perhaps more rewarding. Working with these ancient pictures can bring us knowledge neglected in our education. 